when I was in Tennessee, uh, one of the jobs I had, and I had many jobs uh, going to school, I had, to, I had a lot of part-time jobs here and there, and I, one of those jobs was I was a teacher for the YMCA after school uh, care. Fun company is what it was called, and I watched little kids. It was a very good blessing because my children were in that program. I was able to get paid to babysit my kids. I mean, that's a great gig, right? Uh, and, and one of the things the kids loved was story time, and I would go to the library and pick out a book, and I would read this book, and they, and they would actually sit still and listen and let their imagination go. I liked that a lot better than them watching videos all the time. They get enough of that at home. So I was opening their minds as I read them stories. And one of the books that I checked out was a book called Holes. And it was eventually made into a movie by Disney. But uh, the premise of the book Holes was um, a young uh, teenage boy uh, whose family felt they were cursed with bad luck. Well, he, he got a, a taste of that curse when he was wrongly accused of stealing some shoes. They were, the shoes were donated by a, a star athlete to a children's home, and they literally fell out of the sky into his hands right as the cops uh, caught him with the shoes in his hands. Got sent to a juvenile uh, detention program. Well, this program was out in the desert, and all the kids in this detention, these juvenile kids, were, uh, were tasked every day with digging a hole five feet deep, five feet wide. And that's what they did every day. Why, you may ask? Well, the, the official response, you know, the story reveals there was something else going on, but the response they gave the children, the reason we're making you dig holes is digging holes builds character. Digging holes build you you humped, you know. Do you agree? Does digging holes build character? How many holes have you dug, Eddie? Too many. And uh, and you got the character to prove it, right? <laughs> um, there's a lot of things come our way. And maybe we can laugh it off, shrug it off, say, well, I, I built character. Or maybe we can look at people who are going through problems and says, Hey, it's no big deal. It's just going to build your character. What did James teach us in Sunday school this morning when you go through a trial? Don't whisper it, shout it. Count it all joy, right? And our character, our main character, our hero Joseph, is going through some trials in this entire passage. And this is only the beginning. And um, and, and we could uh we could look at a story like joseph and and say you know joseph has what it takes to succeed and we can try to emulate joseph or we could take any character from the bible and say that guy was smart enough to to get through we'd be fooling ourselves wouldn't we if we just look at the bible and pick out a character and say i want to be like that guy because he had it going on he knew what to do that's foolish thinking. Joseph didn't really know what to do. None of our, I don't think any of our heroes in the Bible ever really knew what to do, except only as far as God showed them and revealed it to them. So our hero really isn't Joseph. I'll call him that just because it's easier and it's, he's the main character. But the real hero in this story and every story in the Bible is God. God is the hero. God's the main character. God's the one who knows how to get through. God knows what's going on. God's got what it takes. Why? Because God is sovereign. And uh, and we shouldn't be ashamed of that. As free will Baptists who believe in free will, we shouldn't be ashamed to talk about the sovereignty of God. Our our, um, understanding of free will does not take away from God's sovereignty. Do you believe God's in control? Yes, he is. He is in control. I, and he's given me free will, and I can make choices, but my choices will never, ever, ever get in God's way. Neither were yours. And so this is what we're learning today, that um, maybe we won't learn it. Can't advance it. Can you, uh, can you click on that? Get the next one going. There we go. There's our, there's our big idea today. Nothing can interfere with God's plan because God is sovereign. And as, as we go through, I'll, uh, we'll pick out some things in the story. And you're pretty familiar with the story, I'm sure. I'm not going to read every verse in the chapter. And our, our 
our lesson covers the entire chapter. But looking at what happens to Joseph just in this first chapter of his story, chapter 37, you're going to see some particular things, three in particular, three particular things that can not get in the way of God's sovereignty. They might look like obstacles, and in, in fact, in the story, they might appear as obstacles, but they really are not obstacles. In fact, uh, what we find is they're actually going to further God's plan rather than hinder it. Uh, first, obstacle that's not an obstacle. All right, next slide. The first one, I guess I got to change the batteries there. Um, the first one is family. Family cannot interfere with God's plan. Now, if you remember, uh, Jacob was the grandson of Abraham. Abraham was an old man, childless, but God promised him that through him all the nations of the earth would be blessed. You would become a great nation. And Abraham was like, what? I don't have kids. And then he had a kid. He had Isaac. And uh, then Isaac... Uh, he, his, him and his wife couldn't have kids, but then uh, miraculously God opened uh, Rebecca's womb and she gave birth to twins, Jacob and Esau. Uh, and Esau was the firstborn, should have, by our thinking, should have received the uh, promise, but he didn't, Jacob did. So the promise continued through Jacob. God reminded him of the promise, restated the promise, you will become a great nation. Ended up with 12 sons. Now he had... Uh, this by four different women. He Remember, he, he fell in love with Rachel and tried to marry Rachel, but there was a little bait and switch going on. He ended up with Leah first. Then he got Rachel. Uh, and then uh, they started to have children, but they, but they were, uh, at some points, they, they weren't having kids. And so each of the wives gave Jacob their, uh, their handmaiden. Uh, and so he took them as concubines. So by four women, he had 12 children. Uh, through Leah, he had Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah. And then uh, he had um, Dan and Naphtali, uh, and Gad and Asher. Then Leah had two more kids, uh, Zebulun and Issachar. And then finally, Rachel, his, the, his one true love, she finally gave birth to Joseph and then finally Benjamin. And when she gave birth to Benjamin, she died during childbirth. Now, I'll, get to, I'll tell you a little bit more about those sons later. But, but at this point, Benjamin is still pretty young. Joseph is young, but he's not the youngest. But we see in the scripture that Joseph is Jacob's favorite child. It says in verse 2 that Joseph, when he was 17 years of age, was pastoring the flock with his brothers while he was still a youth, along with the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives, and Joseph brought back a bad report about them to their father. Now Israel, that's Jacob, Israel loved Joseph more than all his sons because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a very colored tunic. So Jacob had exalted Joseph as his favored son. Now how do you think the brothers felt about that? Especially the oldest ones, the ones who had the birthright, the inheritance. Guys like Reuben and Simeon, Levi and Judah, all those guys. But they all were very jealous. But Jacob had plans. Now, Jacob's been through a lot. He's spoken to God. He's seen angels coming up and down a, a stairway to heaven. And he wrestled an angel. And he was given a new name and all these things. And so he's already, he knows where the story should be going. And like anybody, like us, we try to help God along, right? So he, I guess he decided, I'm going to help God along. And I'm going to raise Jacob up. Who knows what Jacob's uh, ideas for Joseph was? Or maybe he was trying to prevent God from taking Joseph, and so he tried to keep him close. He put this coat on him, and our tradition, our Sunday school lessons have always shown us uh, a boy with a rainbow-colored tunic, and, and stories and movies have been made about it and everything. And, and it may have been a, a rainbow-colored tunic. Most likely, it was just a, a, a different kind of coat than what they wore. It was a coat of position, authority. He had elevated Joseph above the brothers, put them in charge. While they were laborers out there doing the work, Joseph was, was over, the overseer. And he had plans, basically, for Joseph to take over the family business. Perhaps the coat had lots of jewels and ornamentation on him. He was embroidered. But it set him apart. 
And, and that could go to Joseph's head. It could, it could uh, make Joseph think that he's in control of his destiny. Maybe Jacob's in control of the destiny, but God has something else in store for Joseph. And, and we don't know what it is yet. Now, I, I think we do know because we were familiar with the story, but at this point, if you just pretend you don't know anything else that happens in J, uh, Joseph's life, you don't know what God has in store. And it's the same with all of our lives. We don't know what God has in store for us, but we do know where we came from as far as our family. And we do know what mom and dad want for us. And a lot of times when we come to a crossroads in Scripture and in prayer and in serving God, we have to face the decision. Are we going to stick with what mom and dad or our, our family values, our family tradition, are we going to stick with that because it's safe and it's secure, or are we going to step away from that and follow God where he leads? At this point, Joseph feels pretty secure. And now we know God's, the fact that a story is being told of Joseph, we know God has a plan for Joseph. And the obstacle at the front appears to be Jacob's, I guess, grip on Joseph. Jacob is holding him close. Jacob has put him in charge. Jacob does not want anything to happen to Joseph because it's safe and secure. He wants to keep Joseph safe and secure. And don't we all want that for our children? But what happens when your children feel the call of God on their lives? What happens when your children know that God is pointing them in a different direction? Are you willing to let them do that? Or does your, your idea of safety and security for your children actually is that actually what makes you feel safe and secure by holding on tight to them and not allowing them to go serve God is that what's giving you safety and security but in doing so you find that you are trying to be an obstacle to God's will and his plan but he's not going to let that happen he's not going to let that happen and and the longer you fight it the more difficulty it's going to be for you. And so it's not, it's not really an obstacle here. It could be an obstacle, but God's not going to let it happen. God is going to bring Joseph out of that comfort zone through the series of events that are going to happen. He's going to pull him away. It's going to hurt. It's going to sting. He's going to be like ripping off a Band-Aid. It's like going to be breaking a branch off a tree. And Joseph's going to leave this family, and he's not going to be safe and secure at this point anymore. And he's going to be left wondering, what's going to happen? What's going to happen to my family? What's going to happen to the, line, to the family line? What's going to happen to the safety and security? What's going to happen to all my dreams? And that leads us to the next thing that could be an obstacle, but it's not an obstacle. Not for God. Because we're told that uh, Joseph does have dreams. And, and what we see here is, next, there it goes. Uh, it's not our fantasies. Our fantasies cannot stop God from bringing his plan to fruition. Now, by saying fantasy, I want you to realize I'm not discrediting the dreams that Joseph has. Now listen to these dreams. Joseph had a dream. This is verse 5. Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brother, they hated him even more. He said to them, Please listen to this dream which I have had. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf rose up and also stood erect, and behold, your sheaves gathered around and bowed down to my sheaf. Now his brothers said to him, are you actually going to reign over us? Are you really going to rule over us? And so they hated him even more for his dreams. Now in verse 9 it says, he, he still had another dream and he related it to his brothers and said, Lo, I have had still another dream and behold the sun and the moon and eleven stars were bowing down to me. He related it to his father and to his brothers and his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream you have had? Shall I and your mother and your brothers actually come 
to bow ourselves down before you to the ground. And his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the saying in mind. Now, I'm going to say from the front, these dreams were from God. But notice, there's no interpretation given. Now, the brothers, it really doesn't take a genius to figure out what, what the dream means in a general sense. The brothers will bow down to Joseph. Joseph will become a prominent figure in the family, uh, and he will rise above. And if you know the story, what happens later in Egypt, and we're going to get there uh, through our course of our journey, they do bow down to him. He does rise to a, to a powerful position. But I guarantee you, Joseph at 17 years old, and his brothers as old as they were, and his father could not, from this dream, have seen that picture, that future in their head. Now, later on, Joseph interprets dreams for other peoples, and what his response? He says, it is God who gives the interpretation. But God doesn't give an interpretation here. So what we have is Joseph and his brothers and his father, they have begun to interpret it. So there's no question that Joseph is going to be a leader, and they're going to be subject to him. But how that happens, uh, how, how that plays out, what the reality is, is all left to their fantasy. And at 17 years old, if I had a dream like that, I mean, imagine the kind of fantasy that you could invent for yourself if you thought that your destiny was to be a powerful leader. Would you be willing to wait? 20, 30 years for that? Or would you want it now? I bet you Joseph probably wanted it now. Hey, I'm in charge now. Bow to me now. I've got I've to make this happen now. And so he begins to fantasize what this life could be, what this dream could be, and how he can make it happen. And if he sticks with that, it could be an obstacle to what God really wants for Joseph. And the same is true for all our fantasies. You might not have a dream like this, but you've all had dreams. You've had dreams, you're probably still having dreams, and you wake up from a dream and you say, man, that sounds pretty good, I gotta get on that. And so we begin to plan. We begin to say, what, do I, what looks good for my life? What will make me happy? And if we follow through that, it could be an obstacle to you being obedient to God. It's better to submit to God. It's better to wait and listen to what his plan is. Does God give dreams? Sure. I've had, I've had some dreams in my life that I, there's no doubt God was telling me something. And there's some that I believe that, but I, to this day I still don't know how to interpret it. So I've got it tucked away. I've written them down in a journal and they're in a, in a drawer somewhere. And one day I'll know, but right now I don't know what it means. But one day it'll be revealed and I'll know. And I'll say, man, he was telling me this a long time ago. And praise the Lord, now I, now I see. But I don't know what to do with some of those dreams. And I've got a lot of desires that I want to do, I would like to do, but I have to wait and see, is this what God wants? Now sometimes... You know, you just go through with your dreams, and it's not a sin to do that. But God may want something else for you, and you have to be flexible to know that when God says do something different, you can pick it up and go. You can leave the rest of it behind and follow him and not be bound to a past dream. How many of you had to change dreams a few times over the course of your life? Was it difficult? Could, or could you easily pick up and go? As you mature in Christ, it should become easier to pick up and go when he moves you. So what happens to Joseph really puts a, 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 a kink in what his idea of these dreams mean. And he could think, oh man, I guess the dream wasn't real. But he'll find out later. So not family, 
not your own fantasies. They cannot interfere with God's plan. God's going to see his plan come to fruition. And finally, uh, your foes. Uh, not your foes. And in this case, Joseph's foes are his brothers. And so, now one day, in this chapter, we see that Jacob sent Joseph to check on his brothers. They were off pasturing the flock. And so he goes looking for them, and he can't find them. And a man sees him wandering around in the field, and he says, I overheard your brothers, and they went uh, to uh, Dothan. And so Joseph finds them there. Now, because he's wearing this special coat that no one else has, they see him from the distance. They see him on the horizon. So in the time it takes from the time he's this little in, their, in the horizon, by the time he gets to them, they've had time to devise a plan. Remember, they hate him. They are jealous of him. They want him gone. They are enemies. They are fierce opponents. They are foes. And it's their idea to kill him. Now, if they killed Joseph, that would really mess up God's plans, right? If God really indeed has a plan for Joseph. Now, you think God's going up there, up there in heaven just kind of sweating bullets right now? Oh my gosh, what, what's going to happen? I can't let him do this. No, God was in control the whole time, right? God was never afraid Joseph would get killed because jo God was not going to let that happen. But So these brothers want to kill him. They said in verse 20, then let us see what will become of his dreams. Boy, won't they be surprised. Now, back to the brothers. Now, the firstborn of Jacob was Reuben, and then Simeon, and then Levi, and then Judah. Now, Simeon and Levi, they have done a treacherous thing already. Uh, a few chapters back, when uh, Jacob and his family were living in Shechem, one of the king's son fell in love with their, the Jacob's daughter, uh, Dinah. He raped her. But he still loved her. Even after he raped her, defiled her, he still loved her and wanted to marry her. So they, they tried to make an alliance. They said, let, let, the king said, let my son have your daughter. We will, we will intermarry. We will become one people. Now, that, was, that could be an obstacle to God's plan too. So the brother says, here's an idea. We can't marry with your people because you're not circumcised. But you you circumcise everybody in your, in your uh, country, in Shechem. Circumcise them all, then we will marry you. But it was all, it was all a deception because uh, when they circumcised every male, while they were still in pain, they couldn't get up and they couldn't fight, Simeon and Levi went in there and slaughtered them all. Killed them all. Treachery. Evil. Vengeful. So they're out of the running for people of influence in God's, in, in Jacob's line. Now Reuben, Reuben did a terrible thing too. It says in, in chapter 35, verse 22, it says, It came about while Israel, while Jacob was dwelling in the land, that Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine. His concubine was pretty much his wife, and Jacob's son, Reuben, slept with her. That's an abomination. That's a sinful thing. And there's no getting over that. And so he's out of the running. And you'll find out later that uh, he loses, being the firstborn, he loses his birthright. And you're going to see, I want you to pick up on this as we go throughout. Reuben, he has a very good intention in this chapter, in chapter 37. It says in uh, chapter, uh, verse 21, Reuben heard this. He heard the plan that they wanted to kill Joseph, and he rescued him out of their hands and said, let us not take his life. Reuben further said to them, shed no blood, throw him into this pit that is in the wilderness, but do not lay hands on him that, we, that he might rescue him out of their hands and restore him to his father. Reuben wanted to spare Joseph's life. Reuben wanted to bring Joseph back to Jacob. Now, perhaps he thought it would make amends. It would make up for what he did in the past. It would, it would erase his sin. But he wanted to save the boy. 
but they don't listen to him. They do put him in the pit, but they don't have any intention of bringing him back to the family. It's Judah who speaks up. The fourth in line, Judah says in verse 26, what profit is it for us to kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. So Judah too says we shouldn't kill him. It's wrong to kill him. I'd like to kill him, but it's wrong, and I don't want to do anything wrong. But we don't have to bring him home either. And we can get a little, uh, a little spending money at the same time. So they sold him into slavery. Now, notice this. Reuben's the firstborn, but he has lost all influence in this family. The brothers do not listen to him. And you're going to, that's, that's going to be repeated later on. Reuben will speak up later, and, and they won't listen, but they'll listen to Judah. Right or wrong, they're going to listen to Judah. He's the one they listen to. But these foes want to kill him. They decide against killing him, so they sell him into slavery. And he's out of their hands. Now, that would look like an obstacle. To rip Joseph away from the family line, from all inheritance, from everything, it would look like an obstacle to God's plan getting fulfilled. Now, God has made a promise. First to Abraham, then to Isaac and Jacob, and our, we're left with, can God even keep a promise? Is he able to keep a promise? And the Bible is full of us wrestling with that question. When he rescued the Israelites out of Egypt, can he even rescue them? Can he keep them alive in the wilderness? When he sends Jesus as the Messiah and he gets crucified, can God even save his people? And Scripture proves time and time again that, yes, he can. He can. He does keep his promises. He is mighty to save. Nothing can prevent this. But he, goes, he gets sold into slavery. They kill an animal and pour blood on his coat, and they take it back to their father, and his father grieves he weeps so violently. He thinks his son is dead. He thinks God's promises have failed. He thinks the plan that God had set him on has come to an end. And Joseph ends up in Egypt. Now, I want to give you a little hint we know from the end of the story that Joseph recognizes that God was behind this the whole time. And, here's, and I think here's a, here's a very clear hint in this chapter. See, one time Abraham was in his tent and three men showed up. When Abraham saw the men coming, he made a, he made a meal for them. And it turned out that this was God. And he sent the other two men down to Sodom and Gomorrah to destroy it. One time, Jacob was crossing the river with his family, and a man showed up, and Jacob wrestled the man. And it turned out that was God. In verse 15 of this chapter, remember, Jacob had sent Joseph to check on his brothers. Now, the family was living in Hebron, and he was sent to Shechem. Shechem's 50 miles away from Hebron. 50 miles Joseph is sent. Now, I'm scared to send my, well, I was scared to my 17-year-old my child across the street. 50 miles? But he couldn't find them. They weren't there. And then where do you go? He could have given up. If he hadn't already lost Direction, he could have given up and gone home and he would, have, he would have been safe. None of this would have ever happened. Except that he meets a man. In verse 15, a man found him. Who is this man? Behold, he was wandering the field and the man asked him, what are you looking for? He said, I'm looking for my brother. Please tell me where they are pasturing the flock. The man said, they have moved from here, for I heard them say, let us go to Dothan. 
Dothan's another 15 miles away. And so Joseph went there. This mysterious man. There's no doubt in my mind that this was a theophany. This is, this is God or an angel. This was God leading Joseph to where he needed to be. God is in control of this situation. Joseph could have given up his search. He could have gotten lost and gotten devoured by a wild animal. He could have given up and gone home and stayed his father's favorite for the rest of his life. Or he could have been influenced by the appearance of this mysterious man, God, uh, God uh, seeing his will played out, directing him into the hands of his brothers so that he can be sold into slavery and wind up in Egypt so that the master plan of God can come to fruition. Why do I think that? Well, Scripture backs me up by Joseph revealing that God meant this to happen and he meant it for good. And God spared Joseph the entire time. Now, sometimes our enemies can hold us back. The fear of opposition, the foes all around us can, can, the, can hold us back. They can make us afraid to take a step. They can make us afraid to, to reach out, to, to, to stick our necks out and do something brave and right for the gospel. But nothing they can do will interfere with God's plan. And if God allows harm to come to us, you know, perhaps that we'll figure that we'll find out why farther along. We don't always know what's going on. But nothing that happens to us will interfere with God's plan. Nothing gets in the way of God's sovereignty. God is directing it. He's in charge. I'm not saying he forces us like robots, but he influences us, and we respond accordingly to our character, and he knows where we're going. Joseph goes down to Egypt and is imprisoned for some 20 years. I have not been through a 20-year trial. Some of you might have. But my trials have been much shorter and it feels like the end. It feels like there's no escape. But the Bible shows me there have been 20-year trials, 30-year trials, 450-year trials when God's people were slaves in Egypt. And God always keeps his promise. So whatever your trial is, it hasn't gone on forever. And there are there is a plan. And God's got it. God's got it. Count it all joy, my brethren. Count it all joy when you go through trials. Trust God. Don't, don't think because it, what God's got going for you doesn't line up with your family plan. Don't, don't, don't think because what God's got going for you doesn't uh, line up with your own fantasies about what your life should look like. And, and don't think uh, that because your foes seem to be winning that somehow God has lost you. He's still got you. You keep trusting him. Because he will succeed. And when we abide in him, then we succeed.